Hey, what's up YouTube? I apologize that I'm recording in this kind of way. Um, my computer actually doesn't work anymore. Oh, it currently doesn't. I haven't been able to use it since the since late March. Um, it won't hold a charge and I, I think either I gotta replace the battery or the charger cord, maybe both. So, um, I wanted to borrow my wife's laptop to do this reaction, but she actually needs it right now, so I can't. And I'm going to have to go to work any minute now. I mean, at least I can choose when to start, but it's better to start earlier than later, so I can, well, not too early, but better to start at the right time so I can make more money since it's DoorDash. I missed out on reacting to my horse prints from AVGN uh, when that had come out uh, last month because of this issue and I didn't want to try doing a reaction on my phone but this new AVGN that just came out yesterday is of the 20th anniversary when he started his channel you know I, I feel like I kinda gotta do a reaction to that it's a pretty big deal to, I honestly think 20 years ago I said this game sucks and then launched into a tirade dissecting all the things that were wrong with Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest of course, he did originally make this review in 2004, before YouTube existed. Um, but this review, as well as his original Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde review, which is the first reveal of what the character, the Angry Video Game Nerd, or at the time, Angry Nintendo Nerd, looked like. Although I don't know if he even had a name at the time. But, um, I'm sure I'll explain that. But that was 2004. But then, you know, Mike Matei convinced James to start a YouTube channel in 2006, and that's where it all started, right here. Because... I'm the nerd, and my mission is to warn you that lots of those old games that you look back at with sensing all the things that were wrong with Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest. Yeah. Because I'm the nerd, and my mission is to warn you that lots of those old games that you look back at with sentimental longing are actually steaming piles of goat shit. <laughs> Don't go near them. The thing is, at the time... Uh... Growing up in the 90s, I mostly played Super Nintendo and uh, N64. I also played some Sega Genesis and PS1. We had all four of those consoles, as a matter of fact. And we did, for a time, have an NES. Um, I don't remember what happened to the original NES that we had, but then we later had the NES Mark II, the top loader, which I thought was kind of cool because they made the controllers look like the Super Nintendo controllers. Um, anyways, um, there were some games I remember playing back then that I should probably have not liked at all. Frantic Flea, which I, I learned from SNES Drunk, was the only game developed by whatever the company was that made that game. And I don't know why, I just kept trying to play it, kept trying to get through the game. It's a really hard game, but to be fair, it's not just a hard game, it's an unfair game because you move a little too damn fast and it's not really that good of a game. <laughs> Um, and I don't know why, I just kept trying to be like, yeah, this game's fine, and I actually made it pretty far in the game, but then I lost track of the passwords I had, say, I had written down, and I was like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, now there's internet, so I could just, if I played that game again, I could just start wherever I want, but, <laughs> yeah. Um, and there were other games I, like, tried to make myself enjoy, but shouldn't have, like, um, NFL Blitz is an awesome game. Awesome in the arcade, awesome on the N64, awesome on the PS1. But there's a Game Boy Color version of NFL Blitz, and it is awful. And even back then, I didn't really enjoy it. But then I just kept playing. I was like, oh, you know, I'm starting to enjoy it. Like, no, I was just kidding myself. So, yeah, James, you have a you have a point. A lot of things you look back on, no, they're not that good. I'm, I didn't know who I was talking to. It was this, that lots of those old games that you look back at with sentimental longing are actually steaming piles of goat shit. Don't go near them. <laughs> the thing is, at the time, I didn't know who I was talking to. Yeah. It was the summer of 2004, and YouTube didn't exist yet. So I was pretty yeah. much ranting into the thin air of sorrow that lingered over my stale room of dusty game consoles and VHS tapes. In my closet, underneath a pile of socks and underwear, <laughs> was a shoebox full of old NES games. And there it was, Simon's Quest. Like a call to action, I became somebody you now know as the fucking nerd. Back then, I wasn't yet the angry video game nerd. I wasn't even the angry Nintendo nerd. Episode one, I didn't have a name or a face. I was just a voice. 
Just a voice in your head telling you to stay away from this filth. <laughs> was I even wearing my white shirt when I spoke those words? No, to tell you the truth, it was hot, so I wasn't wearing anything. Ah. Just kidding. So for this occasion, mm -hmm. I'm going back to my roots when I was only a voice. Simon's Quest was released in North America in December 88. Using some Christmas money, I bought it from Toys R Us. I played it constantly, and at the time, I noticed nothing wrong. Hmm. Even though I was endlessly traveling in circles, it didn't matter to me. Because I was stupid. No, it was because it was a time of innocence. Yeah. It was 1989, most likely, when I first played it. So by the time I reviewed it, about 15 years had passed. While publicly, 2004 is known as the beginning of the nerds era, for me personally, it was the end of the Neolithic nostalgia age, leaving hmm. behind my childhood in a spiteful fart cloud of frustration. Damn. It was like coming out of a hangover and then realizing how much you drank the night before. <laughs> oh, those nights. It all seems like fun and games. Your judgment's impaired, you're making merry, but afterwards, your head is pounding with humiliating defeat as you begin assessing all the damage you caused to yourself. With how many bad games there are, yeah, it's through. hard to imagine why Simon's Quest was the first one I picked. You all know <laughs> what I picked next. That yeah. one where I had to drink a six-pack of Rolling Rock and show you my face on camera for the first time. <laughs> and after I re-re-re-revisited it so many times, yeah. I finally beat the game with the help of my future self. Yep. I exercised that demon, so let's move on. <laughs> this time, I actually want to talk about something a little more positive. Okay. If episode one was a coin, this is the flip side. If I thought Simon's Quest was the worst Castlevania game, well then... What's the best? Super Castlevania Yes, 4. I already answered that in my yeah. Castlevania 4 part episode in 2009. Yes. I said my favorite was Super Castlevania 4. Yep. But the question now is, do I still believe that? Hmm. Are any of the challengers able to claim the throne? Some great choices there. Uh, Rondo, okay, so Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse. I don't think that'll beat Super Castlevania 4. It's great that you can switch between characters in that, but Super Castlevania 4, I personally believe, is, a, is an improvement over that game, especially with the controls being better. Um, Rondo of Blood on the top right. Uh, a lot of people think that's the best castle, classic era Castlevania game. Castlevania Chronicles... Um, what? Don't you mean Symphony of Night? What the, what's Castlevania Chronicles? Uh, Castlevania Bloodlines came out a couple years after Super Castlevania 4. I'd say Bloodlines is a pretty solid game, two playable characters, although I don't see that much use for, um, was it John Morris, the whip guy? Because you can't whip in all directions. You can only whip at an up, forward, diagonal angle when you're in the air so you can hang off of stuff. The, was it Eric Lacard, I think was the guy's name, with the spear? He can stab in every direction. Uh, which makes him a lot more useful in my honest opinion um and his weapon has longer reach um oh wait there's symphony of the night at the bottom right i don't know what castlevania chronicles is but the but but the bottom of the bottom right is symphony of the night and uh a lot of people agree that's the best castlevania game but you know what there's also people out there who uh, have looked upon the later metroidvania castlevania games um that came up for the game boy advance or gba or the ds you know um and what they have done to improve upon Symphony of the Night. For me, personally, um, and you know what? You can say my opinion's wrong. Because, you know what? Maybe it is. Ah! But, um, it's still just an opinion. I grew up in the 90s and somehow never played a Castlevania game as a child. It wasn't until I got a GBA in the early 2000s. Um, and... One of the first games I played on it, it wasn't the first game, but one of the first games I played on it was Castlevania Circle of the Moon, and I love that game. In fact, uh, on my Nintendo Switch, I have uh, the, I forget what it's called, it's like the, it's um, a Castlevania game that has all three, all three of the Game Boy Advance games playable on it. And uh, for a long time, I actually had never heard of Order of Ecclesia, which came out after Circle of the Moon. I first played Order of Ecclesia by downloading it to my Wii U some time ago, before I even had a Switch. Um, I always thought Aria of Sorrow was the next game, and I did play that on GBA, and I thought it was a lot of fun. I didn't realize there was going like, to be 20 different freaking endings, though. I'm not as much into games that do that, because it just... 
I don't know, I understand the reasoning for it, but it just kind of, I, I find it kind of annoying because it's like, hey, I wanted to beat the game fully, but I only got this kind of ending. Now I'm annoyed. <laughs> uh, I guess it's just a little impatient there. But Circle of the Moon, so far for me, and I get it, it's the first Castle Gain and Castlevania game I played. It's my favorite Castlevania game. I love the DSS system where you get the combined cards for magic abilities. Um, I love how every time you beat the game, you get to unlock um, a new style of play. Like you beat the game normally, which is the Vampire Hunter mode. You unlock Magician, which allows you to have all the DSS cards, but your stats are weaker to make up for having all that magical advantage. Uh, you beat that, you get you unlock the fighter mode, which actually is the easy mode for sure. You beat the game twice, you get the easy mode. Fighter mode, you have no DSS powers, but who the fuck cares that you don't? Your stats are so overpowered when you're in fighter mode, you just plow through everything in front of you. <laughs> it doesn't even matter. So, yeah. Uh, and then after that comes the shooter mode, which actually is a really hard mode because your stats are weaker once again, but you have more hearts so you can throw more sub weapons and your sub weapons are more powerful to make up for it. But other than that, you're weaker, so it's a lot harder. Then after that is thief mode, which actually is kind of easy too, because while your stats are a little bit weaker, I think they're not, not by, it's not by much. And thief mode gives you a ton of luck so that enemies drop more, more items. So you get way more healing items, way more equipment. You'll, you'll, get, you'll land DSS cards more easily. Um, thief mode is actually kind of easy because of how many items you can easily get and how much you can power up yourself. Um, but still overall, fighter mode is the easiest because your stats are just so damn overpowered. <laughs> um, even though you can't use DSS at all, at all. Anyways, that's off. That's uh, what I think. I have played some of the classic Castlevania games. I uh, played um, Bloodlines and enjoyed it a lot. I've beaten it on all three difficulties. I uh, have played uh, Super Castlevania IV, which is my favorite of the classic Castlevania games. In fact, in 2018, I did a live stream on Twitch of the entire game. And I had fun with it. I, I decided to dress up as The Flash, and this was 2018, so this is before we knew about how crazy Ezra Miller would turn out to be. And um, also, um, just think of it as the character of The Flash, not the, not the actor. Besides, there was a Flash TV show that had a different actor, a different Flash, and uh, as far as I know, there's nothing wrong with the actor from the show. <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> um... But yeah, and I've played a I've played the first Castlevania on the NES. Um, I forget. I think I originally downloaded it to the Wii, and then I later on played it on the NES Classic. Oh, when I live streamed Super Castlevania Four, that was live streamed to my SNES Classic. Um, but and I have played. Uh, Castlevania 3, I believe I did that via the Wii Virtual Console. Um, although I'm sure, I don't re recall whether it's available on the Switch Online or not. I think it is, but I don't recall. But I, but I, yeah, J uh, the nerd is not kidding. Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse, my god, that has a hard game. It's brutal. It's so brutal. Anyways, why don't we continue this? Sorry I talked for so long. Let's continue. Well, first of all, I'm talking about the retro era of Castlevania yes. games on the main consoles. In the four-parter, I mentioned most of them. Some yes. would consider Castlevania 3 to be better than 4 because of the multiple characters, the forking paths, yeah. or maybe just because it came before. Those are all valid reasons, and it's well, totally legit one. if you're more of a Castlevania 3 kind of person. I replayed it, and I still have to say I favor 4. Yeah. The 16-bit graphics and sound are more effective for immersing you into the spooky atmosphere. Yeah. The control is so much smoother, yeah. and not to mention, you can whip in all directions. Yeah. It's better. I agree. And it's not as ruthless with so much of that knockback bullshit. Yeah. Some would say knock. I mean, there's better jump control too, so it may, it's just a better game. I mean, it's not to say that Castlevania 3 is bad. It's a damn good game. It's just Castlevania 4 improved upon some things. Back is what makes it. And it's not as ruthless with so much of that knockback bullshit. 
Some would say knockback is what makes it challenging. I say that's what makes it cheap. In some cases, I mentioned yeah. Bloodlines. This would be the Sega Genesis's answer to the Super Nintendo and Konami's tradition of always making two separate versions during the 16-bit war. Yeah. I can't ignore that Bloodlines gives you the choice of two different characters, and there's some very interesting level design, yeah, but definitely. in my opinion, it's not as interesting as the spinning room and all the things that happen in 4. In Bloodlines, you can't whip in all directions, and this time I don't see why not, if they would have taken one note from 4. Sure, you can whip down and also diagonally up, but only while you're jumping. In 4, you can do it from the ground. I could go down the list and say the same. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You can't with John Morris, but just use the Spearman Eric Lacard. He's better. You can stab in all directions. Just use him. Sound effects and music aren't as good, this and that, but the whipping down and also diagonally up, but only while you're jumping. Yeah. In 4, you can do it from the ground. I could go down the list and say the sound effects and music aren't as good, this and that, but the whipping alone is enough to settle it for me. Once again, I stand by what I said in the old video. Bloodlines is a great game, but it's not as good as 4, for me personally. Now, it's time to talk about the one I missed entirely, Castlevania Chronicles. And it was on PlayStation, so I have no idea how I was completely oblivious to this game's existence. So I. Perhaps I I've confused it with Castlevania The Dracula X Chronicles, which was the PSP version of Rondo of Blood with updated graphics. Mm. It also included the original version of Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night. But anyway, the Castlevania Chronicles was originally released in 1993 on the Sharp X68000 computer exclusively huh. in Japan. Okay. So it's no wonder I didn't know about it back then. But it was re-released on PlayStation in 2001, which is the version you're seeing right now. Again, it's no wonder why you weren't aware of it. In 2001, By 2001, the PS2 had already come out. Most people would have moved on to the PS2. Granted... Those who got the PS2 could have still played the game because it was backwards compatible with the PS1. But, um, yeah, most people would be trying to play the new PS2 games as opposed to the PS1 games. I mean, still, I can understand why it was um, kind of forgotten. Ooh, the music is great. Great remixes of those scenes from the various Castlevania games. It's essentially a remake of the original Castlevania Again? with redesigned stages. It's Again? I beat it in less than three I hours, so it's Castlevania a nice before. confined experience. But I'm not going to lie, I played it on the easiest difficulty setting possible. If I were critiquing the original release, I would probably say it's way too fucking hard. But in the PlayStation version, there's two modes, original and arranged. Arranged mode has some slight enhancements with graphics and sound, but most notably, it lets you adjust the difficulty and doesn't have the knockback. Now, oh, if you nice. want the knockback, if you're a gaming masochist and love the insane challenge, then you still have the option, and I tip my hat to you. <laughs> to me, fair difficulty is very important. I don't want it too easy, but not too hard either. For me, Castlevania IV is balanced perfectly. Chronicles isn't that remarkable since it's pretty much a remake of the first game. And while 4 is also kind of a remake in a sense, kind of, yeah. as it's basically retelling the events of the first game, it offers a lot of new stages exactly. that bear no resemblance and is much more original than Chronicles. That's true. Again, Chronicles it doesn't have the eight-directional whipping. Ah. It's more like Bloodlines. You can whip diagonally while jumping, but in Bloodlines, it's diagonally upward. Again, Here, the it's spearman. downward. Pretty strange how they got parts of the controls right, but they just couldn't give us the whole damn thing. Yeah, it's Not weird. as good as 4, but it's a great game. It gives you that old school, basic Castlevania experience, and it's nice to have finally played it after all those years of being oblivious. Yeah. The search for the true successor to Castlevania 4 led me down an uncertain road. In my four-parter, I talked about Castlevania Dracula X on Super Nintendo. Yeah, I talked about how the whipping was a step back to the NES style, and the Couldn't difficulty was rather sadistic, yeah, it was, especially yes, that yes. final battle with Dracula. 
I lightly brushed upon the fact that this was a remake of Rondo of Blood, which was on the PC engine in Japan, but yeah. did I actually review Rondo of Blood and include it as part of my Castlevania marathon? No. No, I didn't. PC, uh, for those who are not as familiar, the PC Engine um, in Japan, when it was released worldwide, or at least here, in, or at least when it was released here in the U.S., it was it would be called the TurboGrafx-16. It was the first 16-bit video game console. Um, yes, it came out before the Sega Genesis, or as it's called internationally, Mega Drive. Um, I am not entirely sure why the first 16-bit system wasn't successful. Maybe there just was a lack of marketing. I mean, it was not by Sega or Nintendo. It was by Hudson Soft, and uh, there was another company. I don't think it was was it NEC or was that or were they behind the Neo Geo? I don't remember. But maybe they just didn't have as much of a marketing budget or something, um, or maybe it was just too early or something like that. Because obviously, the Sega Genesis. And the Super Nintendo both were really huge successes, with the with the Sega Genesis selling about 28 million units worldwide, and the Super Nintendo selling uh, I think it was 49 million units worldwide. Both very successful platforms, um, and the greatest rivalry in video game history for sure. We still talk about that rivalry today. We don't talk about the 360 versus the PS3. They they were neck and neck for much of that generation and remained i mean 360 was ahead of the ps3 for a lot of that generation but the ps3 went ahead of them and put the 360 in last but i think one reason why we don't talk about that rivalry is because it was a it was a rivalry to get second place the wii was in a comfortable lead against both consoles the entire generation except maybe when it first came out because the 360 came out a year before <laughs> so yeah <laughs> um anyways Rondo of Blood. I, I am curious about that. I, I wish uh, there were more easier ways to play it. The, I've only played. I haven't played the original Rondo of Blood. I've played Dracula X before, but not Rondo of Blood. And that was a fucking shame. Yeah, you should have played it. But I'm not sure how he could have played it back then. Maybe it was like a PSP. Ever since the anything. PSP, there's been many ports of this game, so it's not as elusive as it once was. Right, I finally right. played it all the way through on the PS4 and got 100% completion oh, for the congrats. first time. Congrats. And now I can see that Dracula X was definitely not a direct port in any way. Huh. Sure, there were some similarities, but Rondo of Blood is a very different game that, quite frankly, blows Dracula X to smithereens. All right. The graphics and sound effects give you everything you want. The music delivers even more tracks that rank up with the most classic Castlevania tunes. And the natural feel and satisfaction of destroying enemies could never be better. Right from that opening stage, you're whipping skeletons against a fiery background before you realize, hey, that's the first town from Simon's Quest. <laughs> it's like burning down the memory of a shitty game with a kick-ass game. <laughs> awesome. All around, it reminds you of the other classic Castlevanias. You have a dungeon, a clock tower, even a ghost ship, and amazing cool. boss characters, both new and old. The enemies might be a little strange. Am I seeing this? The bats are carrying swords. Yeah. There's a secret character you can find, Maria. Once you find her, she becomes playable. It's a lot like Castlevania 3, where other characters join, but unfortunately, you can't switch between Richter and Maria on the fly. Aww. You have to choose one or the other on the menu, which is kind of disappointing. Mm. Maria is a very powerful character, okay. and I find myself playing as her just as much, or maybe more than Richter, but man, what a bizarre character. Totally out of place with the franchise. I mean, she's going around throwing cats as one of her sub-weapons. And yes, you can explain that four of her six sub-weapons are based on the four guardians of Chinese mythology. Huh. As if that makes throwing cats look totally normal. There's also a bunch of prisoners you can find, which are more or less Easter eggs, but none of them are playable characters. Okay. Thank you very much, Maria. It's nice that it gives you save slots, so unlike the earlier games, you can keep your progress. Also, Hey, the menu theme. That's the same one from Circle of the Moon when you're on the menus. It's, it, it was literally the same one. I heard the creepy tone, uh, creepy voice. That was 
I wasn't expecting it to sound exactly the same. It said it gives you save slots, so unlike the earlier games, you can keep your progress. Also, if you accidentally get a sub weapon that you don't want, you still have a chance to pick up your old and one circle again. The moon That's that. really nice of them. Yeah. The earlier games would have just said, fuck you, you're stuck with it. Yeah, and circle On the, the other moon hand, do that. the like whipping that. is a major downgrade, even from Bloodlines and Chronicles, because now you can't even whip diagonally at all. What's mm. the deal with that? I don't the know. pause feature is a little bit dysfunctional because the music keeps playing. I don't understand the reasoning. The whole point is to pause everything. Your mom calls you or your dog starts barking at something. You want to stop and hear what's going on. So you got to pause, put down the controller, pick up the remote control, and hit mute. What were they thinking? So this is the first I Castlevania game on a CD, so the sound capabilities are a major advancement. Bet, but this yeah. also gives it a field day to incorporate a lot of really weird voice acting. Who are you, mister? I am Richter Belmont, vampire hunter. You proved amusing to me. It's your fault for being so mean to everyone. This is also the first in the series where the anime aesthetic is so prevalent. Mm. While made in Japan, I always assumed that the earlier games were going more for a Bram Stoker, Hammer Films influence. Yeah. So it definitely strayed from that. Okay. It's crumbling! Everyone, run for it! Look at Maria's ending. <laughs> wow. If you would have shown me that screenshot, I would have never guessed that's a Castlevania game. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> The question remains, is it as good as Castlevania 4? Well, it's got to be close, right? It's linear for the most part. It's old school, how I like it. The advancements, such as the save slots, the opportunity to keep your old items, the secondary character, should all give it the added bonus points to overtake 4. Okay. But the stiff, horizontally restricted whip is a major setback, and for this reason alone, I do not like it as much. But... There's a whole other factor that threw my decision into further question. Something so perplexing that it nearly turned my opinion into a never-ending stalemate. <laughs> nearly half the game is hidden. I thought it was kind of short until I realized there's all these secret levels I didn't know about. And when I say secret, I mean secret. It's not like in Castlevania 3 where you come to a forking path and decide which like way you want to go. This is more like Tomorrow. the cryptic bullshit you'd find in Castlevania 2. You might have to break through a random wall oh, okay. or hit a certain spiked ball so that it falls and opens oh, yeah, the that's, path that's below. Hard. Or you might have to yeah. kill a certain enemy to reveal a switch that opens a staircase. Or most of the time, you have to take a leap of faith and drop down a pit that would normally send you to your doom how would you ever know to do that without looking it up you'd either have know. to fall by accident or deliberately drop down every pit you see <laughs> and <laughs> here i am true. trying to evaluate whether or not i think rondo of blood is as good as four and i nearly miss half the game because i didn't know about all the hidden paths i have never been more confused with my own opinion <laughs> On one hand, this means it's a much bigger game than I was going to give it credit for. It even has a cemetery stage, which nice. I said I wished the series had more of. But on the other hand, the game is like one big giant Easter egg hunt. This is the reason I criticize Castlevania 2 so much. Mm. So what am I trying to say here? Is Rondo of Blood the best or worst? It has all the things about Castlevania that I love and hate. And if you have such a great game in there, why keep so much of it hidden? The final nail in the coffin is all the sadistic knockback shit, which yeah. is just plain cruel. Fuck. Fuck! Ooh. Fuck! Nope. Castlevania 4, all the way. Okay, yeah, the knockback is... So, out of hand. while it seems that's the end of the road, that 4 is my undefeatable champion, Symphony of the Night, I think, is worth a rematch. Yeah. Just to recap things I've said before, this is the first Castlevania that said, hey, you know what? We're going to be like Metroid from now on, yeah, except yeah. for the occasional 3D. And you'll be going through Dracula's gigantic castle for the entire duration of the game. 
no outdoor scenes or very little. I mentioned how every time you die, you have to endure an excruciatingly long game over screen, only to send you back to the main title and load the game all over again. In Circle the Moon, um, when you die, you do have to deal with a game over screen and you have to wait for it, but the wait is not that long. It really isn't, and you don't have to start the go from the start menu. It asks if you want to continue or quit. You just press continue, and you'll and it'll start you off at your last save point. So, yeah, big improvement when it comes to game over, <laughs> for sure. I mean, t granted, this came out on the PS One, and those who grew up in the '90s, you know what I'm talking about. If you played P the the PlayStation. Those loading screens, man. Those damn loading screens. That was actually one reason why I preferred the N64. I didn't have to deal with that shit. <laughs> Trust me, I, I love the PS1 as well. Twi the Twisted Metal games. Actually, my favorite Twisted Metal is Twisted Metal 4. I liked making custom uh, cars and stuff. It was really cool. And I liked uh, the variety of uh, battle stages. But and I also enjoyed playing... Um, Command and Conquer Red Alert Retaliation on the PS1 a lot as well. Um, and there were some other games too, but um, no, N64 was still my, what I preferred. Mario 64, Super Smash Bros, Mario Kart 64, Diddy Kong Racing, GoldenEye, Perfect Dark. My favorite FPS is Perfect, is Perfect Dark, a great improvement over GoldenEye. Just overlooked because GoldenEye was more of a revolution while Perfect Dark just improved upon it. I will say I, there are some games I missed out on back in the 90s. There definitely were, definitely. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, come on, the PS1, those damn loading screens. Oh, my God. Sometimes they would take so long. Now, yes, they usually weren't that long, but there were a few of them that took like a whole minute, you know? And that was kind of annoying. Usually it was like around 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. But there were some that took way longer. And it sucked. <laughs> so, yeah. The loading, the, the, the issue with the discs loading might have something to do with why when you get a game over on Symphony of the Night, it takes so long. I don't know if that's the reason because I think I've gotten, you know... I've lost on other games on the PS1 and didn't have to wait that long. But, he, he, I don't know. <laughs> Fuck that. I mentioned how I preferred the common sense challenge. You have to endure an excruciatingly long game over screen, only to send you back to the main title and load the game all over again. So messed up. Fuck that. I mentioned how I preferred the common sense challenge of four. There's no tricks. You can't turn into a bat and fly over shit. You never have to think, which way am I supposed to go here? Which item should I use? Am I equipped properly? Should I grind and level up? None of that. You just run through and play. In Symphony of the Night, the main character is Alucard, who mainly uses a sword, so the eight-directional whipping isn't even applicable at this point. You only play as Richter in the very first scene, and as sort of a bonus after you've beaten the entire game. In fact, you even have to beat the damn game upside down before you get that far. But after so many years have passed, I found the real secret to enjoying the fuck out of Symphony of the Night. All right. I say, beat the game, unlock Richter, and then take a break. Take a good long break and come back. Now, you're playing Castle fucking Vania. <laughs> First of all, I wasn't aware or had forgotten that Richter had so many moves that aren't immediately apparent. It still bugs me that they never brought back the eight-directional whipping, but for some reason they still included that limp twirl or whatever you want to call that. But with all the new moves, yeah. it kind of makes up for it. So, yeah. Richter here is just as much fun to control as Simon. First, there's... Yeah, that, uh, that slide kick on the ground you can do in Circle of the Moon. And it, what was weird was I was playing Order of Ecclesia on that Castlevania collection on my Switch where it has all three of the Game Boy Advance games. And I couldn't do the slide kick. I'm like, why can't I do the slide kick? There's this little gap that is too short and I got a slide kick under it and it's not letting me do it. And I'm like, 
you have to unlock the slide kick? What the fuck? <laughs> like, what? Why? Uh, then again, in Circle the Moon, you only can walk and slide kick and jump. You have to actually unlock the ability to run, although you do that before you even face the first boss, so... You know, at least there's that. But you start out with the slide kick, you know? Um, but no, that kick he does in the air where he just kind of goes, lunges forward in the air, that is a move I haven't seen in any other Castlevania game. I don't know if it is in any other Castlevania game. Maybe it is, but I have not seen that except with Richter in this game. So I have to admit, that's really cool. That cool little backflip thing. And then there's the sliding kick. Man, I love yeah. that. I love it so much, it has become an addiction. I mean, <laughs> why just walk into the next room when you can slide kick? Yeah, yeah. yeah it never gets old. <laughs> then there's the dash attack, which is kind of neat That's whenever cool. you have time to pull it off. You have to press up, down, down, forward, forward, attack. That's a bit What much. is this? Fucking Street Fighter? Yeah, what the hell? Down, up, jump makes you do an uppercut, which is not just a great attack but it also serves as an infinite jump to reach higher places. Wait, infinite? Unfortunately, it's extremely awkward to pull off. Any move that makes you hit down up while you're in midair is fucked as hell. That's and I weird. think there's a certain speed to it. You can't hit it too fast or too slow. Mm. I don't get it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But you absolutely have to do it a lot because it's the only way you can reach certain spots, especially when the castle goes... Oh, wait. I just thought about it. The reason why they let you do it infinitely is because when you're normally playing the game as Alucard, you can become a bat and fly all over the place. So... Okay, allowing you to do the uppercut infinitely, I think it makes up for not being able to fly, so I get it now. I was thinking, like, what? That seems kind of cheap, but then again, Alucard can become a bat and fly, so okay, I get it now. It makes sense. It's upside down again. Yeah, but you absolutely have to do it a lot because it's the only way you can reach certain spots, especially when the castle goes upside down again. Yes, it's like replaying the entire game. So all those spots with Alucard where you had to turn into a bat and fly, now you have to uppercut into the air over and over like a madman. I'm sorry, I just You still have your sub-weapons, but unlike Alucard, Richter doesn't have any items to equip. No inventory whatsoever. Huh. But after all, that is basically what I wanted, to return to Castlevania's simpler roots, okay. as opposed to a more complicated RPG system. They Playing as Richter it, is an entirely different experience, and is like a mandatory second half of Symphony of the Night. Okay. And in the Saturn and PS4 port, you can also play as Maria. <laughs> Damn. Holy well, shit. maybe I'll have to try more of that next time. Yeah. But after fully experiencing it as Richter, I can say, I definitely enjoyed it a whole lot more than the main Alucard game. Did I enjoy it as much as 4? In a lot of ways, yeah, I think so. This past playthrough was the closest I ever came to replacing 4 as my number one favorite Castlevania game. All they had to do was this. Make Richter the main game, and then have Alucard be the second half or as a secondary character. In that case, I would have found this contest to be a lot easier to decide. But even then, all the ungodly time spent reloading whenever you die is a major strike against it. Sometimes, it comes down to the simplest things. In 4, I can never forget that feeling of gratification when you land on a stairway and moonwalk, or when you latch onto something with the whip and feel that momentum build as you swing yourself the back and forth. Easy to do that. How about the appealing sound of those golden platforms and treasure chests spilling coins as you walk across them? Or the sound of the bones collapsing when you hit the skeletons? Yeah, it's a great sound. It's countless little things like that. And why is the eight directional whipping so important? It's because it gives you the feeling of freedom. When you engage with an enemy, you can decide whether you want to strike from the air or hit him from below. Your instincts take over rather than trying to adapt to some clumsy limitation. Maybe this game spoiled me. And maybe, maybe you'd say the full whip directions make it too easy. How does the whip save you from all that crazy shit near the end, like when the giant sprocket's chasing you up the stage? It still gets pretty damn hard. The full whip controls just give you a fair chance to hit anything on the screen. You and the game are in perfect competition. No cheap shots. You're not fighting with one hand behind your back. You're in full control, so when you die, it's on you. Yeah, pretty much. Some things stay the same. And Castlevania 4 is still my favorite. 
Okay. And other things vary, such as my complex thoughts about Castlevania 2. Even though it pissed me off, I was still able to look back at it again and realize there's much I appreciate. So I can change my mind a little. Yeah. But one thing I can say, if it wasn't for Simon's Quest, you might not have ever known about me, and I might not have ever known about you. Why else would I still be doing this? This battle against shitty games has been quite a ride, and all the memories created since, to me, have gone far beyond just Castlevania. This has been 20 years and counting. Yep. So Godspeed and fuck balls. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. Oops, sorry. Hit my uh, atheist ring against the counter by accident. For Nimoy! <laughs> oh, the 10 year anniversary was the Mega Man one. Loved it. Such a fantastic a episode. He got to the final boss, which is that freaky alien head. looks like I chose the perfect video to do this uh, on the phone because the screen was not widescreen it was yeah I definitely chose the right video to do this oh my gosh what are you doing yeah cuz it was it's four by three instead of uh, the, the widescreen so I, I my face wasn't even blocking the view so it was perfect you know Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. I'm so sorry I had to do this on my phone. I would have preferred doing this on a computer, but my computer just isn't working. And uh, my wife's computer is unavailable, so I had to do this on my phone. And yeah, that's actually why I didn't do the previous AVGN episode. I wanted to do that one, but I had to prioritize work. Didn't want to deal with the computer issue. Didn't want to try it on my phone either because I um, didn't want to do it this way. But... This was the 20 year anniversary of AVGN being on YouTube. So I just was like, I gotta do this one. Gotta find a way to do this one. If I can't, I can't use my computer because it's not working right now. Can't use my wife's computer because she needs it. Um, so I guess I'll try to find a way to do it on my phone. And I, I hope you guys are okay with this. I hope this was still very enjoyable. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I plan to do a tier list actually. But this is something I'll probably do when I can use my computer again. But yeah, I plan to do a tier list, and I think this is the perfect time to do this, to do said tier list, for sure. Um, it'll be a lot of fun to make. You'll probably it might be done as a live stream or as a premiere. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, it will be something I would do when I can get my computer running again. Um, thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Click that bell icon to have me notifications. And yeah, I appreciate you watching all the way through, um, despite uh, how I had to record this. Uh, great episode. Really great episode. Um, he didn't show his face, but it was a great episode anyways. He did it in the, in the style that was done with his very first nerd episode with 
Simon's Quest. He didn't show his face until the second episode with uh, um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Um, so, I'll be having some more shorts coming out soon, more Johnny Depp shorts, more Christopher Walken shorts. Those are actually doing pretty well, so you got to keep going with that. And uh, thank you so much. Stay tuned.